So he runs over and puts the gun to my son's head and says, I notice he has three other kids in there. I'm going to count to 10. If he doesn't tell us where the money is, I shoot this one, go and get another one. Eventually, you'll get the mes a message with Sirius. Welcome to the pod. Although there's uh, very interesting stories in Crimea, um, there's one, 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 I won't say exceptional because the others are also exceptional stories, but, uh, but uh, this particular story, a lot of people like to hear. Um, what happened was, you have to understand that the Crimea, when we came there, besides being uh, something you can't even, you can't even think about it, <laughs> what kind of a place it was, and definitely was like the Wild West. Um, it was, uh, in fact, it was one day just as an introduction what kind of place it was. Uh, one time a mother came to us and cried, cried. Her son disappeared. And those years, it was quite possible that uh, something mafia and killed and free clothing. If, if a guy owed uh, $14, Okay. Could be uh, the mafia would wi wipe out for fourteen dollars. He would wipe out. Okay. How much and was that that's then? What there? happened? Oh. What was it? A lot of money then? It wasn't. It was. Uh, was that a thousand shekels. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't a thousand <laughs> shekel. It was basically what it was. Fourteen dollars. If you could think about nineteen ninety one, what uh, basically what fourteen shekel it was. That's yeah, it. The, same, same, wow. same, same difference to the American dollar. Wow. It was, it was, it was three, three point, uh, three point something, three point yeah. five, three point seven to, to, to the dollar. Wow. So it was, uh, and, and it, that's what happened here. It wasn't even this guy owed the money. There was a, a friend of his that owed $14 to a mafia. Uh, the guy paid the mafia to, wipe him out because he wasn't paying that $14 back. And uh, this guy, he gave him two for the price of one because this guy happened to be there when he knocked off that one. He knocked right. off the uh, friend too. Guilty friend, by unfortunately, <laughs> the friend, unfortunately, was Jewish, was this uh, son. And I had, I knew the head of the mafia, one of the heads of the mafia. So I went over there. So my wife, I'd, actually, I was out of the country at the time. My wife give her credit for this one she went over there she went over to him and uh told him uh we need that body back and he wow. said back off don't wake up my wife said no he needs a burial he needs a jewish burial and uh wake up. she went straight and to the mafia to ask the, for the body yeah yeah, yeah the, head wow. guy, the head guy I mean, we're not gonna snitch and the we guy. just want to bury him properly <laughs> right and wow. uh so he said okay wait in a few days you'll find him and they found him in a few days, and, wow. and then they was able to be brought to a Jewish burial. But uh, so that was the that's that was the, the type of place. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just the, the introduction, that's, right? That's that's the type of place this was. Wow. Okay. Now um, comes along. <clears throat> what happened was that came Simchas Torah. Uh, Yontiv Roshani, Yom Kippur, we had, of course, things were happening, going and moving, and it was very lebedic, the whole Tishrei. And Simchas Teira, um, Simchas Teira, my custom was always because I was on Shlichas all the years. And on Shlichas, you always ended up in a place pretty much yourself. You're starting new places. When you start a new place, you don't have a bunch of chassidim over there dancing. And uh, giving you the care so that you can rest a little bit while the others are dancing. No, if you want to keep going, you got to keep dancing and not stop because the moment you stop, it's over. So you don't want no shifts. A, you don't want a uh, hakafis to go for one hour. You yeah. want it to go for a few hours. You want it to be a, mem uh, a memorable time. So I, um, so I always used to make kiddush on a glass full of vodka. <laughs> and that way, nope. I didn't know when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> that will carry you through so the holiday. That would holiday. carry me through, even go beyond what my kaychas were, my normal kaychas were, and I was able to uh, hold out. So in any case, so that that it was one of the first years that I was there, and in Crimea, and uh, 
we had a coffee I made kiddush on vodka and uh, just as down as, uh, as uh, what they're called uh, chasers we drank a few more cups and uh, we <laughs> and vodka? So yeah, vodka as we chaser had, for vodka chaser. you got more vodka <laughs> right but in any case that's Russia <laughs> right Russia I had to fit in <laughs> so when in Russia <laughs> So we, so um, I was a little bit left, a little high, <laughs> uh, not, uh, not that much really. I still knew what was going on. Still kedusha though, you're but, doing uh, with kedusha in mind that, too. Uh, hopefully, hopefully <laughs> that was my thoughts. But in any case, so we actually were able to keep the dancing going to till a quarter to eleven, night, and uh, at quarter to eleven, that point. The, the others were tired. They didn't drink as much vodka. <laughs> but uh, at that point, so I invited everybody to come over to my house to fabrain, continue fabrain in the meal. Join us for the Sudas Yontif. So we had uh, about 40 people, whatever it was, that came came home uh, with us. And we, we, uh, we sat and fabrained. We finished, we finished at about a quarter to one. And uh, that's when... Everybody went home except for Ida. I shouldn't explain who Ida was. Um, but before that, to explain what I did, I had hired my secretary's husband. Uh, it was interesting. Almost everybody there that we dealt with was named Sasha. So <laughs> my secretary was Sasha. Or her Alex. Husband, her Alex husband was Sasha, and they had two daughters that they named Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could never figure that out. Uh, and then there was a dog that used to hang around that was also named, uh, given the name Sasha. <laughs> so it, it was, uh, Sasha was the name. But in any case, so this Sasha, the husband, Sasha, I hired him to watch my sukkah. Why? Explain to you what happened the year before. Not to us, Baruch Hashem, but I didn't want it to happen to us. In another city, there was someone else put up, not a Chabadnik, put up a sukkah. It was a group of guys put up a sukkah, a prefab sukkah. Those of you that know what the prefab sukkahs look like, it's cloth, blue and yellow, with brachas all over them, pictures of Lulav and Esraigim, and that kind of thing. These are the prefab sukkahs. So they put up the prefab sukkah uh, the, the day before, and they wake up the first day of Sukkot in the morning to find the frame, but none of the material. The material's all gone. Two days later, they see women walking in the street with new dresses, blue and yellow dresses, with brachas all over them. <laughs> they call those them. And uh, so... So I didn't want to wake up in the morning. Russians are not <laughs> known for their fashion, really. <laughs> and uh, I did not want to wake up in the morning with an unkosher sukkah and then not be able to eat uh, eat a sunzyant. So Mela, I hired this guy. I told him, your job is just to watch that nobody walks off with, uh, with the material on this sukkah. And, where is and it? Uh, that, that's your job. <laughs> and so he did it. So during the week... During the whole week, uh, uh, first of all, the sukkah, the reason was because the sukkah was outside. We couldn't build the sukkah in our, on our property. We had to do it outside the gate because in the gate was all trees and uh, mm. you couldn't have the sukkah there. So we built it outside the, the, the gate. So I had him, I had a car. I had him sit in the car during the first days and during Chalamite, uh the intermediate days. But when it came to the last days, we were having parties every night, and then for the last days, I sent, we had Bochum, we had rabbinical students that were helping us, and rabbinical students that wanted to send to other cities to make lively in other cities. So I sent my car with these other students with a sukkah mobile, with a sukkah attached on the back of it with a trailer, and they went to another town called Yefpatoria. And there they were, we were in Simferopol, which was the capital city, Simferopol. And they went to Yepatoria for the last days. And uh, my, I had five sons 
that were still at home. The rest of my older children, after I know 12 children, all the older, the seven older ones were off in, in, in America, different places. Some of them were married already. And uh, the five younger ones were home, but the oldest of the five, he was, uh, he was about 12 years old. He was still before his bar mitzvah because he sent him away for his bar mitzvah. So he was about 12, and he went with them to the Yefetoria. So he wasn't home. But the other four were home during this story. And uh, so the guard, I couldn't have him sitting outside because it was cold. It was too cold at night to sit outside. So I had a separate room inside uh, the gate, but I told him I need him to keep going out. So I told him every 15 minutes, I want you just to go outside, give a look, so at least you'll catch them in the middle if they, are, they do want to start taking it apart. It'll take them more than 15 minutes. So the guard you, was there just for the sukkah. So the guard was just there for the sukkah. That's it. So he was in that room. And got, so sure enough, a quarter to one, everybody leaves. He goes and locks the, door, the gate, goes into his room. And me, meanwhile, my wife was exhausted because all the cooking over Yontiv and everything is doing and not sleeping at night. And I uh, also was having a little bit of mashke and also. So my wife fell asleep. She was exhausted. She fell asleep right on the table, right by the table, her head down on her hands on the table. That's where she was sleeping. She bed? couldn't even get, no, in the, in the house. Uh, this was some story at night. Already. And she was, she was out cold. Me, I've, I was able to make it to my bed. <laughs> I got to my bed and I lied down to, to because I was also quite tired. I also didn't sleep and also was, uh, had a little bit uh, imbibed a bit. And so I was, I was tired too. And we both forgot about Ida, about Ida. This woman, Ida, was what in America they would call a bag lady. Now if you, a bag lady is basically a woman who never doesn't have a place. She lived around the corner from us in a little room that you couldn't call a room, you could call the closet without windows, without bathroom, without a, uh, what you call, without a sink, without water, running water inside. She would have to go outside to get uh, from the pump that was every several blocks. And that's the way she lived. And the way she managed to buy food was she would go through the garbage dumps and take bottles that she could uh, get the deposit for and the, with those few cupcakes she was able to buy food to eat and that's the way she was living she was it seemed like she was from a better background a bit because we noticed that she actually kept herself somewhat lean she would go twice a week to the van to the bathhouse where she would get a, a take a bath and and uh, or a shower whatever and keep herself somewhat clean and my heart went out to her that this is the type of life not that we had we we had nothing either when when they sent us on shlichas you had to make your own and i wasn't doing too well in the finances and uh, I, I, I we didn't have but this this really bothered me so i called her in one day and i asked her what how much do you make on collecting these bottles? And she told me it turned out to be about $8 a month. So I told her, I'll make a deal with you. If you don't go to the garbage dumps anymore, I will give you $10 a month. I'll give you $10 a month so you're ahead of the game and you'll, you'll do, and, and, and just don't go to the garbage. I, I just don't want you going to the garbage anymore. So she was, you, you saw she was, a, I don't want any charity. I say, you know what? It won't be charity. I'll ask you to work for me, do a job for me. So what kind of job? I said, much since you come to me anyway, Friday night and Shabbos to eat by me, she's one of my guests, regular guests. I said, I want you Shabbos night. You'll wash. The, the, I didn't have to. We all served paper plates and all these things, so most of the things went in garbage. But like a pot, look, what you call it? and that's what I'm paying you ten dollars, ten dollars a month for that for that job. And she agreed, she, uh, she agreed to it, and that's what she was doing. But of course, when Shabbos night would turn into a yontif or something, we, no, you can't work on yontif for the money, so tonight's different, not. But that night was Shabbos night, was Simcha's Teja, 
and my wife was exhausted, and I was out of it a bit, and so we forgot to say anything to her. So she was standing there. She stayed to wash these few pots and whatever it was. Uh, anyway, so this is at quarter to one. Everybody left. And let the, guy, the guard, 15 minutes later, one o'clock, he goes to check the sukkah. He goes, the gate is open. He locked it. He opens the gate, he opens the door, he looks out, doesn't say anything, everything seems quiet, closes it and locks it again, and goes back to the room. Fifteen minutes later, one fifteen, again he goes to the thing and the door is open again. And he pulls open the door and looks out. Again everything seems quiet, but then he notices that the lights in the sukkah are off. He knows that we don't turn on off the lights in on, on Yontif. So it's something funny. So he goes to look in the sukkah, and that's when they jumped him. Three guys with guns and knives jumped him, and so he gave a yelp. Now, when he gave this yelp, you know, so my wife woke up. She was lying, she was head down on the table. She heard a yelp. She woke up, and it sounded like a child's yelp. You know, because there was a knife against his throat, so it sounded like a child's yelp. And she right away thought, one of the kids is outside. And what's he doing outside in the middle of the night? So without thinking, she ran to the door and oh. opens up the locked door. And all, all of a sudden, three guys push in with guns and knives and tell her that, okay, don't get nervous. This is just a holdup. This is just a robbery. And... Uh, I'm sure that my wife was thinking, says, oh, just a robbery, come on in. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I make tea, that's all I have. <laughs> but anyway, whatever, obviously she didn't respond that way, but she was, uh, but yeah, but they were in, and they pulled masks over their, as we call them, of their faces, and they, um, they come in, and they tell her that the word on the street is that you have a million dollars, and we came to uh, make it a, light, a little lighter for you. No, to take your money for you. And you're snoring. You. I was in my bedroom. I was sleeping. Now, my wife was convinced that I was sleeping for at least an hour and a half or two hours. It wasn't true. When I came out already, I looked at the clock, and it was a, it was a quarter to two. So I know that I wasn't even sleeping a half an hour. But my wife's convinced, so I won't, <laughs> I won't fight with her on that. But I, I, I happened to look at the clock, so I do know that I wasn't out that long. But in any case, so they pulled in the guard, they had him lay on the floor, and they were pointing one gun at him, and my wife sat down on the bench, we, we had bench, we didn't have anything in the house. We didn't even get our furniture yet from America when we came to Crimea, when we were there at this time, it was a couple of years later, but it was still, we didn't, we didn't have yet our furniture. And so we had built for the camp, we had built a, a, a rickety wooden uh, table, uh, three tables and benches. And that's what we had. And we didn't even have bookcases. So for our farm that we had, I, I had taken orange crates, milk crates, and we piled them up one on top of the other. And that was our bookcases. Uh, there were holes in the walls. The tablecloths, we had uh, sheets for tablecloths sheets with holes in the sheets, and we had an outhouse. We had an outhouse, and uh, we didn't like the idea of an outhouse, so we started building a bathroom, but it didn't yet have, it wasn't a working bathroom yet, and it was a, it had, it was, it was cement walls, and so, you know, it definitely did not look like the house that a millionaire, millionaire is, is living in. And so, like, she's trying to show him, hey, come on, you got to be kidding. <laughs> Wrong if address. we had a million dollars, you'd think we'd be living this way. But they're not listening. They're convinced we have a million dollars. That's it. And, of course, she couldn't tell where it was. She must have forgotten or whatever. But <laughs> whatever, she couldn't tell where it was. So they're sitting there. They're, they're starting to look themselves. So the head guy comes into my room where I'm sleeping. And I suddenly wake up. And... I see a guy opening up the drawers of the dresser and uh, wearing a mask. 
So I thought one of the Bokram playing a joke, playing a t- trick on us or whatever. I, I knew which Bokram I had. <laughs> Type of guys that might want to play a, a, a joke. So I just sat up. And when I sat up, so he turns around right away and points the gun at me. So I understood it wasn't, it wasn't the uh, one the Bachrim. Not a regular for bringing. So he says uh, it was a for bringing, but not the regular. For <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, so he turns around to me, pointing the gun at me, and he says that um, he says the word on the street says the same thing to me. The word on the street is that you have a million dollars here, and we came to get it, came to share it with you. <laughs> that was the word. That's what he said. Came to share. So, so manners. So, much yeah, manners yeah. so, so I, I said to him, I, you have to understand, like I said before, I react not the regular way when, when, when things happen. I just, I, I just take a uh, very chilled uh, outlook on things. So I just looked at the guy and said, I'm sure that if the word on the street is that I have a million dollars that must be true but it wasn't delivered yet so if you leave me your name and number I'll call you when I get it <laughs> that is exactly what I said to him and the guy <gasps> just blew, the guy just blew a gun he starts shaking the gun at me oh my and he says to me he says this is no joke and I said, if you think I have a million dollars in a place like this, it's got to be a joke. There's <laughs> no, no basis for this belief at all. Wow. So anyway, so he starts saying, so where do you keep your money? So I said, so I said, actually, I spent almost all the money that I had before Yontif. I'm left with forty dollars, and that's in the, so I don't have a special place for it. It's in my shirt pocket, which is hanging over there. So he goes over to my shirt pocket, he empties it down, and sees sure enough forty dollars there, nothing more. And uh, what else do you have? I said nothing. We, we just don't have anything. We're not doing that. So anyway, so he starts looking. Said, okay, fine, look. And um, so he's looking, and then suddenly I realized that well, it's pretty quiet in the house. Where's my wife? Where's my kids? Now, wondering where, where are they? It's very quiet. So I get up to go look. And he says, We get up. And he says, to, he Turns around again to me, pointing and says, Where are you going? I said, No, it's very quiet in the house. I want to see my wife and kids are okay. He says, They're okay. I said, Well, you're not quite the uh, <laughs> trustworthy, the trustworthy <laughs> guy that I'm going to trust your word on it. I want to see it for myself. And he says, I'm totally ignoring his gun. I'm just walking. <laughs> He's pointing the gun at me, and I'm just ignoring it. I'm just walking further. Oh. So he, he runs after me. He says, he says, wait here. Give me two minutes. I'll go in and ready them for you, and then you can. I'll come back for you and bring you in. So it's okay. I'll give you two minutes, but not a second more. Okay, and he goes out. He, runs out. Long as he came back. Anyway. He came back. No, he came back less than two minutes. He came back. He knew I wasn't going to wait. I, I said, Two minutes, that's what I'm going to do. So he comes running back, says, Okay, you can come in now. Let add to it, I found out why, why did he want to go in first. Because the guard was lying on the floor with a gun pointed to his head. Mm. He didn't want me to see him that way because he saw already that I have a crazy reaction to things. <laughs> Who knows how I would react to see that. So he wanted him to sit up on the, on the bench like my wife was. <laughs> so he ran in there, had him sit up, and then he came back for me. <laughs> so I came So I came into the room. So to get to the dining room from my bedroom, I had to go through the kids' room. I had the four kids sleeping over there. And I see as I'm walking by, I see the kids are still asleep. So I said, please keep them asleep through this. More chance that they'll get through this. <laughs> you know, if kids get up, you, you lose control. It's not. I said, let them sleep through this. Thank you. And walk by there. I come into the dining room and I see that the uh, my wife, is to me, she seemed like she was sitting quite calm. My the the uh, she, uh, the, the, um, the she was sitting quite the the, ro- the guard the guard he uh, his knees I heard knocking <laughs> <laughs> he was he was scared because you know the the word there was that when robbers come into your house whether they get what they want or not you're gone you're, wow. you're gone no witnesses that, that's right uh, wow. no one no one did you lives notice through it. I knew it, I knew it. But anyway, listen, 
they wish to run the world, not not to be called not the guards and not these crooks. So whatever they wish to decide, whatever. You see, you see how the story develops. That uh, what my thinking was on this. So I come into the. So 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 I said to my wife, I'm glad to see that you're sitting calm. She said, calm, I'm not calm. <laughs> <laughs> that, that you are, you're relatively calm. What's going on? You're relatively calm. Nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> be embarrassed. And I sat down. Anyway, so again, they try and get me, get us to tell what we got, and, and we try and convince them that there's nothing. So we start sending around at the other as they start telling guys to start looking. And meanwhile, they try and convince us that we should tell them where the money is, and we're not telling them because there's no money. <laughs> so finally, the guy says, the head guy says, you know what? I saw you have your kids over there in the room. I'm going to take one of your kids as a hostage, and when I and when you come up with a million dollars, we'll bring them back. So, and he sends the uh, sec- uh, the second guy to go wake up one of my kids. I told him, I turned to him very seriously, and I said, I wouldn't do that if I was you. That looks at me. <laughs> Sounds like I'm telling him what to do. I wouldn't do that if I was you. So he looks at me and he says, why do you say that? I said, I don't understand something. When you came in, you told us that you're professionals and you do this for a living. Did you ever come across such a reaction before? in one of the houses that you came in and you were holding people by gunpoint and the two people, the two hosts are sitting there so calmly and quietly and allowing you to do what you want and not, not showing you any nervousness. Did you ever see this before? Let me explain to you what's going on. I said, you see, we are believing Jews. We believe in God. And God is the one that runs this world. God is watching what's going on over here. There's, you know... We, I know that God is watching this thing. And if God decided that we have to go through this, okay, that's his decision. And if God decides that I'm going to be get, dead tomorrow morning, guess what? Whether you intend to kill me or not, tomorrow morning I'm going to be dead. And if God decides I'm going to be alive tomorrow morning, you can take that gun and put it right against the temple of my head and pull every, the trigger, every single bu- bullet in that con- gun into my head, and tomorrow morning I'll still be alive. It's all in God's hands. The only problem is I really don't know what God decided yet. So, <laughs> so me, from my standpoint, what I did was I realized my life was in danger, so I said my last prayers, so now I can afford to just sit back and relax and wait to watch this scenario go through you know whatever happens happens God's God's in control and he's going to decide what he wants and that's he probably already decided what he wants and that's it I don't you know I, 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 there's nothing I can do about it so I said my prayers that's all I can do about it and I'm ready to just sit back and watch what's going on that's that's it but now you want to add a new thing in this scenario you want to take my son as a hostage for that Torah tells me I have to react differently I need to get up and try and stop you. So now what's going to happen is I'm going to get up to try and stop you and you're you're going to lose it and you're going to shoot me. And so it's going to become tumultuous, it's going to become a balagan, it's going to be noisy, you're going to have to run. Like this, everything's quiet, you can go look, maybe you'll find something you like in the house. But like this, you're going to run without anything. So you have no gain, we have no gain, and uh, it, it, it's stupid. It's a stupid move. Forget about the hostage. Meanwhile, the other guy comes in with my the oldest of the four sons that were left there. He was 10 years old, and he brings uh, the, the, the other guy comes in and holding him. My wife was hoping that he wouldn't see the guns, so she motioned to my son to come to her, so lean on on her so that possibly wouldn't see the guns. <laughs> so he tries to go to my wife and this guy is holding him and the leader says to him, let him go to his mother. So I saw that the leader was okay, agreed that he's not taking him as a hostage. <laughs> so he comes to, so he comes and this guy is really more trigger happy, the second guy. And he's ticked off. Wait, what second? I thought we'd take him as a hostage. Where did he didn't hear my speech? <laughs> my wife laughed afterwards when she wrote up the story. She said, 
that she was sitting there in amazement watching me <laughs> give this speech because she said, I sounded like a professor in the university <laughs> <laughs> giving a theoretical speech. <laughs> said, According to my theory, <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to like the outcome of this. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was like totally... <laughs> <laughs> wiped away to try to figure out what's going on <laughs> you know with, with, with my head you know guess. but in any case so the guy so this guy the second guy really is trigger happy and he he's really mad now so he runs over and puts the gun to my son's head and says i notice he has three other kids in there i'm going to count to 10 if he doesn't tell us where the money is, I shoot this one, go and get another one. Eventually, you'll get the mes a message with Sirius. And you speak Russian, obviously. No, they, this was going on in English a bit. Okay. They, they knew a little bit of English, the, especially the head guy knew English. So I give the head guy a look that he saw in my eyes. Okay, you just lost control. I'm standing up now. That's it. It's over. Yeah, right, right. And he, he saw me move, and he's right away screamed at the other guy get out of here i'm handling the people you go out and look over in the other room see what you can find and he threw him out of the room he threw the second guy out of the room and i so so okay so now we can chill out again <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sitting okay. there. <laughs> so, wow. so sit back okay fine and meanwhile you hear banging all over the house they were throwing over closets and they were throwing to going through everything, throwing uh, paintings off the wall that, uh, and, and, and uh, trying to find where we have this money hidden. And uh, of course, they didn't find anything. They weren't able to find anything. But in any case, meanwhile, we're sitting there and uh, there were a lot of miracles that were going on, by the way, here. Uh, first of all, the head guy had taken my wife's jewelry box. Now, my wife didn't really have any jewelry. I, I bought her one thing. She had uh, some pearls and maybe a bracelet and but she had some jewelry real jewelry from her grandmother also a little bit not a lot was in this but in the box was also the Rebbe's dollars that we had gotten so that's the only thing i was thinking the Rebbe's, dollars. The Rebbe's dollars and <laughs> we had also the little book called Raziel Hamav. wow that's, and we had that that's why you're okay in that in that way called in that in that uh, box and he brings the box into the dining room and he opens it up and he sees the Rebbe's dollars. So he picks up the Rebbe's dollars and he drops it like he burnt his hand. And he's looking, he's sitting there looking at the dollars on the floor. When the second guy comes in, he sees the dollars on the floor. He says, what dollars on the floor? He runs over and picks it up and he drops it like he burnt his hand. This is what going in front of our eyes, you know? He drops it like he burnt his hand. And they both stand there looking at it when the third guy comes in and he sees on the floor and he says, why are you guys leaving down the floor? And he starts to bend down to pick it up. And the other two start screaming, don't touch it. There's something wrong with it. And you, you, you just don't touch it. There's something wrong with that money. So, so the guy backs off. He does, he does this. <laughs> anyway, and there was, there, there was my wife at one point. She was sitting near the books, the, the Svarim. So she turned around, took her till him. And she opens up, starts saying till him. And the head guy starts to actually physically starts to tremble and he starts shaking and he says put that away it's scaring me put it away so she got scared she put it away she continued saying to him that she knew by heart and that's all what could she do meanwhile we're looking at we're looking at it was, it was interesting another interesting thing was that after camp you know this was civil history so it was not long after camp what happened was camp, during camp, the councils had made with the kids, you know, like out of popsicles, pictures of the Rebbe, uh, frames with pictures of the Rebbe. So they came, when they came home, they wanted to hang it up in the dining room. We had a picture of the Rebbe in the dining room, a regular picture of the Rebbe. And my wife didn't want these popsicle pictures of the Rebbe hanging in the dining room. So she told them, hang it, hang it in your rooms, in your private rooms. And they, of course, kids don't listen. <laughs> so they went and they hung it up in places that we didn't notice. 
<laughs> they ended up, but it ended up one on each wall. So whichever way we were sitting, we saw the Rebbe Bashkar. <laughs> so they, it was there for that. <laughs> it's like my, my wife looked and she saw a picture of the Rebbe, and picture of the Rebbe, and picture of the Rebbe. And she says, oh, okay, the Rebbe's with us. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, we called. so then she started trying to explain to them, and I tried to explain to them that the Rebbe's with us. The Rebbe sent us here, and he's watching this. And he says, he says uh, I'm, I, I don't believe in Re Rebbe's, I believe in uh, Satan. And we go, it was, a, it was wow. a weird terminology. It was a very weird situation that was going on over there. But we, yeah, we're sitting waiting to see what happens. So meanwhile, everything, so uh, he, he wanted, he was playing around, he wanted to see if I would grab the gun. So he put the gun close to me, uh, but he had taken out the uh, thing. I didn't know, of course, but I'm not touching guns. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's not my cup of the year if I did like my wife said if she would take a gun she'd probably shoot herself she goes, <laughs> <laughs> so we got so so I wasn't I wasn't touching the gun and uh, he saw that I'm not trying for the gun we got, he took it he says good thing you didn't try for it because I took out the clip and he showed me then he put it back in now he says now I have it yeah she said, anyways I see that the guy's bored and he doesn't have what to do while they're looking all over the house so I figured okay so I start talking to him about Sheva Mitzvah's name <laughs> So I tell him, so I start Good telling timing. Him, I, tell him, I tell him, you know, there's seven laws that non-Jews have to keep too. And steamy. two of them, two of them seem to be very apropos. <laughs> <laughs> do not steal, do not kill. You know, just, and I'm explaining to him about this, uh, this uh, you know, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, Anyway, we go through this, uh, I'm explaining this to him. So, yeah. And he says, yeah. And then he says to me at the time, he says to me, he says, Rabbi, are you telling me that if I came back in two weeks without my mask and told you I'm the guy that's putting you through this, you would forgive me for what I put you through? I said, forgive you for putting me through? You didn't do anything to me. If I have any complaints, what's going on here, it's going to be to God, not to you. <laughs> I mean, if I'm, if I'm unhappy with it and if I, if I want to complain to anybody, the only one I would complain to is God. <laughs> A, you're, you're a total non-entity here in this situation. I said, however, you have your own problem with God because God told you not to be doing this. So if you're asking me that if you'd come back in two weeks from now and you tell me that you're keeping the seven laws of Neuch and you want me to intercede for you with God, I said, I have no problem with it. I, said, That's not, I, I don't have a problem with that. Anyway, this this is the way the conversation going with a brain like this for for uh, until five fifteen in the morning. Finally, at five o'clock in the morning, he realizes that he's not walking out with anything. <laughs> so he says, "Rabbi, he says if I tell the guys that this was a flop, they put in four hours here. That you know they worked hard for four hours. If if I tell them there's nothing here, they're not only going to shoot you, they're going to shoot me too. So." something do you have something you can give us i said well we have a computer a brand new computer we didn't finish unpacking yet so that uh, the, you could take that if you want uh we have my daughter left her video camera here if you want to take that so they, uh, you know the, 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 that's what you want to take my wife offered him the, her uh, diamond ring the, the engagement ring so they took that and they uh, and, and they left at 5.15 in the morning. They left at 5.15 in the morning, and Baruch Hashem, I was able to go, go off to dance in Shul Simchas Ter in the morning with a little bit more gusto. <laughs> I was able to you didn't need vodka in the but morning. But that wasn't the end of the story. It oh. wasn't the end of the story. Two weeks a later. year and uh -huh. three months, or a year and four months later, um, my wife was teaching a class for women in the house. I was in New York. And uh, one of the women comes in late, and she says to my wife, there's a guy outside that wants to talk to you. I don't think he looks like a guy that you would want to come into the house. She says, okay, I'll go, I'll go out. She takes the translator. We were still in those years working with translators. So um, uh, she goes out with the translator, and the guy says to my wife, I was here once before. She looks in his eyes and says, you're talking about a year and four months ago. And he says, yeah, he knew she recognized what he was. And so my wife wanted to get back in the house, but she can't go back in because the translator is standing over there. And to say it in English, he knows English. So she says, so what do you want now? 
So he says, I want to explain what happened after we left your house. When we left your house, what your husband talked to me about the seven laws of Noah took effect. And it affected me. And I decided to give up this kind of life. I left my gang. I went off to the city of Dnepropetrovsk, which was seven hours away from there by car. So I went off there. And there I met a holy woman, non Jewish, a holy woman, who I told her I want to change my life. I told her the background. She helped me, guide me, guided me, and I've become a decent citizen. I don't do these things anymore. And now she told me I have to come back here and apologize to you. So that's why I came back to apologize. Wow. <laughs> We've been, uh, this is an amazing, amazing opportunity to sit with you for the Rav. I want to thank you. Um, but before we let you go, what is your message to the world out there? For the, for the Bnei Noach, for the Jews, for everyone. To everybody. Know that Baruch Hashem. We're going through a time when most people who don't have guidance are convinced that this is a terrible tragedy happening, a pandemic and everybody's locked up in their houses and everybody's going with masks and everybody's and uh, there's fights whether uh, take the take, uh, take the vaccine not to take the vaccine people are losing their friendships over it don't get bent out of shape it's all part of god running the world preparing us for the ultimate promise that the rebbe has told us that we're in that time now we are now entering the time of mashiach and the message is guys Put on your Shabbat clothes, put on your good weekday, uh, your holiday garments, because we're about to greet the Redeemer of all mankind, not the Redeemer of just the Jews, the Redeemer of all mankind is going to bring total peace in the world and going to get us that we should all be working at the right, in the right way, in a positive way, with friendship for everybody, love for everybody, doing everything right. It's about to happen, and how, what is each of us have a job to do to prepare for it? It's an easy job. Picture in front of you Mashiach coming in the next hour and act the way you would act if you really believe that. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a real school to sit with, uh, to sit with you for the, uh, not only a coin, but a coin gadol. I'm Dick Shlichut. So thank you. And thank you to Abidjan for, for the Kesha, for making this happen. That's my pleasure. Thank <laughs> you so much for coming, Rabbi. And, uh, Our pleasure, Rabbi. All right. If you, you give like us a bracha for our show and for the fans watching. And okay. Since I am a Kohen, the best, best blessing I could possibly give is Birchas Kohanim, which is. Mm-hmm. Should have all the good things, everything like only God can give. Amen. Thank you so much for that. Thanks.